First, I would like to thank you for uh, inviting me, for the organizer for inviting me for uh, here. And second, I would like to uh, thank other instructors because they uh, presented things that I'm going to use in my presentation today. Um, and uh, since I have to leave very about half an hour after my presentation, so if you we cannot get a chance to discuss some of the issues that uh, or questions that you might have, my uh, both Google and Inria. Uh, emails are at the on the slide, so feel free to contact me, and uh, we're gonna um, talk about it. And also, all this slide, I'm gonna I share the slides with the organizers, so you're gonna have the slides. If there is something there that we cannot cover, so the slides are there. And again, feel free to contact me. Okay, so let's start talking about safety in sequential decision making. Safety is a um, word that has been used with different meanings in machine learning communities. Sometimes people say that an algorithm is safe if it converges to what is supposed to, to converge. Sometimes we talk about safety if there is a dangerous area that can uh, hurt us. So first, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about the notion of safety that I've been working on in the last uh, four or five years. And this is what I'm going to cover mainly in this presentation. Um, and um, given this notion of safety, we have had different approaches to, to the problem of safety that I'm going to describe, and then we're going to go into the details of each of them, and as time permits, we go more and more in the details. Then there are two optional parts that if I have time, I'm going to talk about it. Um, one is the risk-sensitive decision-making, which is also related to safety, but I just want to make sure that you understand what is the notion of risk-sensitive uh, decision-making. I'm not going to go to any details, even if I have time. And the last part is the new notion of safety that I'm working on these days, and we have some, some results, which, but I'm not going to have time to talk about it. And that second notion is uh, safety with respect to undesirable part of the environments and what is dangerous and what is not. So you can clearly see that the safety that is the main topic of this, this discussion is not safety with respect to the dangerous part of the environment. So let's see what it means. Okay, so now uh, let's start with the definition of the safety that you are using. In a many scenarios, uh, we have a machine learning algorithm. We create a batch of data. We give this batch of data to the algorithm, and the algorithm generates a strategy. So this is strategy, you can think uh, of a recommendation strategy that uh, you want to decide uh, when the user comes, look at the context of the user and decide what to show to the user. Or it can be some um, investment strategy or it can be something that we do in a hospital and the health system, right? So now there is a manager of the system that is between you and the real system and you take your uh, strategy there and see this is working very well. Now the question is why this manager should believe you given all the stochasticity that uh, exists in the world and allow you to deploy your strategy. And this is exactly what happened to me when I went to industry. Uh, it was for recommendation system. I came up with a contextual bandit algorithm. I went to the manager and they laughed at me. Right? So this is uh, the, the question. So now, let's see how we can convince this manager that what I have is something good and you can put it in production without being worried about. So this manager usually has a baseline performance in mind. Either a baseline strategy or a baseline performance. They already they have a strategy in production or they want to make certain amount of money every week, right? So now, if you want to convince this manager, you should convince him that your strategy is going to perform at least as well as that baseline. Then the manager is going to be happy and let you go. But remember, this strategy is the result of this data. And if you change this data, even if you don't change your algorithm, you're going to get a different strategy. So this strategy is a random object whose randomness is coming from your data. So any this any statement that I'm better than you or you are better than me without adding some confidence or probability is going to be incomplete. So now let's complete our definition. Our definition is of safety is a policy or a strategy is safe if it performs at least as well as a baseline with high probability. And this term delta here or one minus delta shows how much this manager is willing to take the risk. If it's a hospital, it's a health of people, or the death and life and death, then it might be a very small value. If it's, I don't know, recommendation might be a little bit different. Okay? So this is the definition of safety that we are going to study today. 
As I said, this is just one definition of safety that people have used in machine learning. Okay. So now, let's look at different ways that we can look at this notion of safety, and this is basically what I have done. There are other ways that you can look, but these are the three ways that I have worked on this notion of safety, model-based, model, model-free, model-based, and online approach. I first give you the basic idea of each of them, and then I go into the details as uh, much as the time allows me. Okay, so let's see what is a model-free approach. In the model-free approach, you have a bunch of strategies, behavior policies, or one or a number, that generated this batch of data. Your algorithm takes this batch of data and generates this strategy directly. And when I say directly, means you don't try to first build a simulator of the dynamical system that you are trying to control and then use that simulator in your control. No, you build it directly. Right? So it's a model free reinforcement learning algorithm for those of you who are more familiar. So this is the scenario that we have. And the question is exactly the same, whether this policy is uh, better than this baseline with high probability. Okay? So when I say behavior policy or behavior policies, think about this, that in recommendation system, they put a, a strategy in production, they do the recommendation according to this for one day, and then put some data here. They may retrain the system at night and then deploy another strategy for the next day and add the same data here. So this is why this batch of data is the result of either one behavior policy or multiple behavior policies, okay? So now, the question is, we want to build a box. This box is taking the historical data as input, takes the baseline performance as input, takes the sensitivity of the manager as input, and takes the policy that you have generated, either it's coming from your algorithm or you just took it out of your pocket. You just want to test it. And this box is going to say yes if this policy performs at least as well as this baseline with this probability, or it says no or I don't know. Okay? So this is what we built and we took it to the managers. The first question he said, what is this delta? And I said, this is your risk. And I noticed that human actually is not very good in ex expressing or quantifying how much risk they are willing to take. So we had a bunch of back and forth, and then what we did, we decided that, okay, let me draw this risk plot for you. And this risk plot basically says that at each level of risk, what is the maximum performance that your policy can beat? Right? So you can see that uh, if this one minus delta is zero, you can beat basically anything. If this one minus delta is, is, um, uh, is one, sorry, if the one minus delta is zero, then you can beat anything. If it's one, then you cannot beat anything, basically. So it's basically how much I give you the leverage. If the manager is very picky, uh, then probably you cannot make him happy. But if the manager is relaxed, then you can, whatever you do is okay with him, right? And then you put this in front of them, and say, okay, now decide whether you want to deploy it or not. And this is actually a tool that was used at uh, Adobe in the um, personalized recommendation uh, for deciding every, every 12 hours they were retraining the recommendation system to decide whether to deploy the new policy that has been trained or stick with the previous policy and continue. They also use it behind the curtain when they had multiple policies from different algorithms or the same algorithm with different parameterization to decide which one they want to deploy it. Then they look at this and decide it. Okay? So later I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what is inside this box. But you can imagine this goes back to Marco's presentation, uh, things related to off-policy evaluation, because we have a policy we want to evaluate, we have data from other policies, and we want to uh, say something about that performance without deployment. So these are the, this is the work that we do, uh, we've done with uh, my intern, Phil Thomas, that now uh, he's a faculty at UMass, and my colleague, George Steelkaros, he published at IIII 2015. Then we said, okay, if we have this box, we can also use this for policy search in the sense that using different ways, either in the direction of a gradient or with uh, some uh, search in the policy space, let's come up with some candidate and give this candidate to this box. And if this box says this candidate is safe, then we act according to that candidate and repeat this process. And then this is the ICML paper that we did in, on this topic, and it was basically a policy improvement using this box or safe policy improvement. 
And then the, the, each client paper is just an application of uh, this with some data from the personalized recommendation. It's a totally applied uh, paper. And this is a very interesting topic in industry, and this is why there are a lot of work here, and probably this uh, s slide is, uh, doesn't contain all the work in this area, because in many scenarios, we have a, a strategy, but we want to have an idea about how well it performs before it, uh, its deployment. And uh, this work, this is the work from Facebook, um, Leon Boutou has done this uh, work was uh, from Cornell, but now he's at um, Microsoft. This is, uh, again, from Microsoft, but these people are now in different places. Li Hong is at Google. Um, Phil uh, did a postdoc with Emma Burnskills. They continued. Uh, there are other things, and we also have a new result which we presented at ICML just a, a month ago. But I'm just trying to say that what I'm going to tell you today is not basically the latest. This is a very active area, and people are very interested in it, especially in industry. So now, let's go to the model base. So in the model base, the scenario is exactly the same. We have a batch of data coming from some behavior policy, and we want uh, to generate a policy and make sure that it performs well. But there is, there is a difference here that first we use this data in order to directly generate a strategy. We first build a simulator of the dynamical system. But when we build the simulator, we also estimate the error of the simulator meaning that I know which part of the world my simulator is good and which part of the world my simulator is bad. Okay? So now, given this simulator and this error bound, I want to generate a policy that performs at least as well as this. And since these error bounds are usually probabilistic, this 1 minus delta is appearing. Okay? So the scenario, the, the only difference is I build the simulator and then go for the learning the policy. And this fact can be useful in scenarios in which building a simulator makes sense. For example, when in robotics that we have a lot of prior knowledge about the physics of the system that we can, um, it makes sense to build a simulator or we don't have too much data compared to the marketing problem, the marketing example that I gave you before. Right? Yes. So this error is error about, okay, mathematically I'm going to define it, but think about it that uh, if you build a simulator from this room, uh, it, this error tells me that in this part of the room, your model is very accurate, so this error is small. In that part of the room, the model is not accurate. Yeah, you build the model, you build the simulator, and then you have an estimate that which part the simulator is good and which part is bad. So which part of the world, if I ask the question from the simulator, I get a reasonable answer, and which part of the environment you ask a question, I get a garbage. What do you mean by evaluation? So let me, let's go to the mathematics. So think about the probability. Uh, so the, the model... Okay. Mm -hmm. So think about this, that you learn the simulator from the data, right? So if the data that you have in this part of the world is a small, then the prediction that the simulator gives you in this part is inaccurate. If you have a, a lot of data in some part, your simulator is accurate, right? But learning this E is a big question. I'm not saying that it's an easy thing to do. Learning it data efficiently is not easy. But this work, we assume that we are able to come up with this, this error. Okay, and now the question is given the simulator and the error to how to learn a policy that is guaranteed to perform at least as well as this, uh, this baseline. So this is the paper that we had at, uh, with my uh, colleague who was at IBM, now he's at University of New Hampshire, Marek Petrick, um, at NIPS 2016. Um, now let's go to the online approach. Online approach is a different flavor. So, so far we are talking about a very restrict manager that doesn't let you touch the system before you convince him. But in some scenarios, the manager is a little bit nicer in the sense that as, as soon as you go with a solution to the manager, he gives you a small portion of the traffic for you to handle. But this manager is not stupid. He, in the random time, he may sit down and do some accounting and see how much he has lost by letting you handle the system versus he himself would have handled the system. And if this error is above some panic threshold that this manager has, He's going to basically terminate you. He goes to the panic mode. And if the error, if this loss remains below the threshold, he's going to let you continue. At Google, actually, this is a very common practice that they give you a very small uh, portion of the traffic, and then they con constantly do A-B testing, and then at some point either they decide to cancel your method or 
they give more traffic or eventually deploy your method. So this is very common. So now, let's see what's happening here. So imagine in this scenario, you have an algorithm that we are very confident about. It's, I don't know, it has a very good regret or is optimal, but it's a machine learning algorithm. At the beginning, it does a lot of exploration. So if the amount of this exploration is in a way that it does crazy things and this manager gets panicked, then it doesn't matter if your algorithm is reaching the optimal policy or minimum regret or not. This manager doesn't let you to have enough samples to reach your good performance. So what we want to do here is we want to control our exploration, making it more conservative. And how much conservative depends on how much risk this guy is willing to take in order to remain alive in this system and be able to collect more samples to eventually uh, outperform the manager and reach the, our, basically, our, our best. So this is the question here is the controlling the exploration in order to remain alive. In the, especially in the first phase that the algorithm does a lot of exploratory actions. So uh, we formulated actually this problem with Chava and then his group, uh, including Tor that is here, they um, applied this problem for multi-arm bandit. We applied it to contextual linear bandits, which is has a, lot, a lot of application in recommendation systems. I know how to do it in finite horizon RL, uh, but for infinite horizon, there are some techni technicalities that I, I don't know how to handle it. There is another way of looking at this problem that uh, is in this paper by Alex Slipkin and Yasha Mansour, which is a very interesting and elegant way of looking at this problem. But it's, a, it's basically they're doing the same thing, but they're looking at this problem differently. So think about the recommendation system. A lot of us, when we go to, to our doctor, to our supervisor, to get an advice, we are not coming out of a vacuum when we go to the recommender. We have some idea. For, for example, we know if I'm a head, uh, I have a headache, probably I need an aspirin or something like that. Or you know about the courses that your supervisor is going to recommend you to take. So have some idea. That's like your, your prior. So now, if every time that you go to your supervisor or your recommender, that recommender, today is your bad day, he basically takes his exploratory action and he gives you a random recommendation. The first time, you may handle it the second time, and then eventually you're going to be get disappointed and you're not going to trust that recommendation system. You probably change your supervisor or change your doctor or uh, don't go back to that website, right? So this is exactly the same scenario, that uh, the, the mismatch between the prior and what you observe should be controlled. Otherwise, so basically you have to control your exploration such that the, the user doesn't see that much mismatch with, with what he or she believes about the recommendation that you should get. So this is another way that basically is very similar to what we have done, but with a different uh, application uh, in mind. It's a very elegant paper. Okay, so these are the three ways that we have looked at the problem of safety. I just gave you the basic idea. Now let's go to the more details and see what is uh, basically under the hood. So let's start with the model-free approach. In the model-free approach, you remember, the whole question was how to build this box. Right? So now I'm going to tell you how we are building this box and what are the ingredients here. Just remember, uh, this is a scenario, the, the, we have a policy. We want to see whether it's performing at least as well as a baseline. And this happens in many fields that you want to have an idea before deployment how well your strategy works. We call it high confidence of policy evaluation. Let's start with some math. Um, so this is a system trajectory. System trajectory is state action reward, state action reward. Basically, you have a policy, you act according to this policy, and this is what you observe. Okay? So the return of this trajectory, this is something that Mark showed with Z, I'm using it with B. So this is called the return of this trajectory. It's the sum of the rewards along this trajectory that I've observed. It might be discounted or not, doesn't matter. Okay? So remember, I, for simplicity, I assume that the reward is between 0 and 1, so this object is between 0 and 1 over 1 minus gamma. So what is the value function? The value function is the expectation of this random object. So if your actions here are according to policy pi, the expectation of this random object is the value function. Okay? So now, remember our scenario. The data set that we have to train is of this form. We have a bunch of trajectories and behavior policies. So pi i is the my recommendation strategy yesterday, and tau i is the interaction of a user with this system when I was recommending to that user according to this strategy. 
Okay? And the, the reason that I'm um, uh, pairing each trajectory with a, with a policy is because we might have different behavior policies. Okay? So behavior policies are pi 1 to pi n. In some scenarios, it's just one policy. In some scenarios, it's many. And then the target policy is pi. Okay? So, and there is a baseline performance VD, and this box wants to do the prediction. Is, is the setting clear? So this batch of data is of this form. Clear. OK? So now, let's look at this object. So this object, if has, the data has been generated by pi i, and we want to see what is what, under policy pi, which is your target policy, how likely is to see the same trajectory or the same return, you basically correct this with this important sampling term or this propensity scoring term. And this is something that Marta showed you in the off-policy um, uh, session, right? But uh, here, since we have a, a trajectory, we have a product of this ratio. It basically says that if I'm in a state xt, this action is according to this policy, what would have been the probability of this action according to my target policy? And this is called the propensity score. And you have a product of them, and the size of this product is the, the horizon of this trajectory. Okay? So now, for each pi i, we have this v hat. This is a random variable. Okay? So now, the expectation of this random variable is always, when the reward is positive, is always less than v pi. Remember, v pi is the expectation. Oops. V pi is the expectation of the return when we don't have this correction. When you do this correction, the expectation of this random variable is always less than v pi. Actually, usually is equal if whenever the denominator is zero, the numerator is going to be zero. Then this is equality. But in general, if there is a mismatch between these two, then this is always the lower bound. OK? So important sampling is an unbiased estimator. But of course, unbiased under this condition, so it's usually a lower bound. OK? So here, since we assume that the reward is positive, so this is positive. And, uh, but the question is, remember, the random variable d is bounded between 0 and 1 over 1 minus gamma. But this random variable, because of that product of ratios, that ha might have a very large upper bound. So it might have a very large range because of the mismatch between these policies, because of this term. Okay? So this is a very a practical example from a two. Uh, this is the mountain car task that probably all of you know. We generated uh, 100,000 trajectories from, uh, from, uh, from mountain car, and these are just two policies, is trajectory of size 20. The sample mean of these trajectories were, was about 0.2. The maximum observed d hat was 316, but the upper bound or the maximum possible value that you can see is 10 to the power of 9. So if you want to think about this random variable as a bounded random variable, you remember when Tor was talking about this random variable in bandits, he was talking about subgaussian. And subgaussian is basically, it's not bounded, but the reason is all these bounds that he was using requires boundedness of the random variable or, or this subgaussianity sub sub property. So this bound appears in the, this, this range appears in the bound. Think about when you take an average, if the va random variable can take value infinite, even if the probability is very low, you have a very good average, you're about to converge, suddenly you see something at infinity, your estimation shoots away, right? So this is why I'm saying that when you talk about this concentration inequality, range matters a lot, because one sample can mess up with your, com your, your, your estimation. So here is the scenario is this, although this 10 to the power of 9 is very rare, but if you want to have some guarantees, you have to think about it. Okay? So this is important. So now, 
let's see that now for each of these trajectories, we have a random variable of form d hat. So now we have this x1 to xn random variable. Each of them corresponds to one behavior policy. All of them, their expectation is a lower bound of v pi, right? So now, if I find the lower bound for this mu with high probability, so what was the concentration inequality? He was talking about upper competence bound. So we basically were building a bound around the empirical mean that with high probability contains the true mean. So here, the true mean is this mu. Now I want to build a, a, a confidence interval around the empirical value that I have observed such that contains this with high probability. So now, if the lower bound that I learn is still bigger than the baseline, then the true mean is definitely be, uh, bigger than the baseline with high probability. So if I calculate this lower bound, and if this lower bound is bigger than the baseline performance, then my true mean is also better, and therefore v pi, which is an upper bound of the true mean, is also better. So the question is the relation between v pi and vb. We want to see whether v pi is bigger than vb or not. So v pi is bigger than mu. If the lower bound of mu is bigger than vb, then v pi is bigger than vb. So this is what this box wants to do. Okay. So now the only thing left is to calculate this mu negative or this lower bound of mu and to have a tight bound. Because if the bound is not tight, then this lower bound is, is very small and it's never bigger than dB. So your box basically comes back with not giving any answer. Right? So we want to build this and we want to build it as tight as possible. Is any question here? Because if you, you're not comfortable with your, what you're hearing so far, then the next step is, uh, is, is going to be more mathematics to build this uh, bound. Actually, I want to understand up to this point, because the rest is uh, a bunch of formulas that uh, you need to learn it by, your, by yourself. It's, but uh, is, is this clear right now? Yes. No, no, no. VB is, 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 is a fixed value. Yes. So the manager wants to make, I don't know, $100 a week. That's, that's the baseline. OK. So now, let's just start the concentration inequalities. The first one is what uh, you saw in, um, in the bandit uh, session, which is just the chernoff of thing bound. The second one is something that um, is very common also in the bandit community, but I don't see it because uh, in, in uh, Tor's uh, uh, presentation, uh, is basically uh, the empirical Bernstein bound that brings also the variance to the picture. And the third one is a, a bound that um, is by Anderson and Massar. So these are three bounds that we consider in our work. These are not the only concentration inequalities that are out there. Um, so now, so the two bounds are for um, IID and ID samples. The last one is just for IID. And what is the difference? Means IID means all the samples have been generated by the same expert. ID means that the samples are independent, but they might have been generated by different experts. Okay? So that's in, in our context is this. So in, in the bound, you see that this is the range of the random variable that is appearing. And this is the number of samples. So if this range is big, this bound becomes bogus or it becomes very loose. We need to do something about it. Okay. So um, we decided to use the uh, maurer pontil uh, empirical Bernstein uh, bound in our work, um, and um, but we, we we got improvement over turn of thing. Turn of thing was super loose. Basically, we needed gazillions amount of data in order to have uh, a reasonable type or lower bound. This was a little bit better, but not much. So one uh, trick that we did there was we did clipped importance sampling. So this is something that um, unfortunately, Marta didn't have a time to talk about this. There's an algorithm called retrace these days that people basically cut uh, this random variable um, if it's larger than something. So this is the, the, the algorithm you see. If the random variables are x1 to xn, you define a new random variable yi, which is the minimum of xi and some threshold that you cut the random variable. 
This way you don't allow the range to be too big. And this has been studied in uh, statistics called uh, Vinsorization is a name that I found out. Clipped important sampling is also something that people have used. And given this, you can calculate this lower bound. So now the question is, what is this clip point? What is the C? How can we calculate this C? So technically, we should calculate this C such that this lower bound becomes maximized, because we want a tight lower bound. But um, the question is, if choosing this, this uh, clipping point is dependent on the samples, then we have problem here. So what we have done is we took the data, we divided the data to two parts, we used the first part, which was a smaller part, in order to maximize this lower bound and calculate the value of C. And then we use the second one in order to, using that C, recom recompute this lower bound again. So one part of the data learns the clipping point. The other part of the data is used when the clipping point is fixed to calculate this lower bound. And uh, here, In the experimental results, this is exactly the same mountain car problem. If we use the churn of hoofing, the lower bound that we get is ridiculous. It's basically minus 5 million. Basically, it's useless. This box, in this case, becomes like an expert that basically becomes like a wise man that never talks. Because he doesn't want to make a mistake. You go to him and ask questions, he says, I don't know. So he never makes a mistake, but uh, he's, he's never useful. With uh, normal uh, uh, branch skin, this is a much better than this, but it still is, is large. With uh, Anderson and Maurer, was, the situation was a little bit better. Here we had only one behavior policy, so we could use the Anderson Maurer. But with this clipping technique, we managed to get something much, much tighter. Okay? So this is another example, which is the personalized ad recommendation simulator that we had there. Um, this is the, the target policy. And so the behavior policy has this performance. The target policy has this performance. Of course, we calculated this performance by cheating. Basically, created a lot of samples because of a simulator to just know what is its true value. But in application, we assume that we don't know this number. And then when we use 2 million trajectories, and these trajectories are the interaction of the user with the recommendation system, that you show things and you see whether the user clicks or not, right? With 2 million, Using this um, uh, formulation, we estimated the lower bound as 0 0.077. So this was still enough to beat this and say this policy is safe. Because it was, the lower bound was bigger than the, the performance of the behavior. Then we, then we increased it to 5 million, then we got much better. And then we said, okay, now let's also deploy the target policy, mix 1 million of trajectories with this, so 5 million, we got even better solution. Right? So basically, it confirmed that this is a safe policy. Okay? So any question so far? Yes? In, in this example, we have one behavior policy, which has this performance. No, so, in, in, so remember, even if you have multiple behavior policy, the goal is still being better than one baseline performance. So it's not the case that you want to be, be better than all of them. Yeah, then it's a different. Mm -hmm. That's possible, yes. And also the formulation of important sampling that you see that I've used here is the vanilla formulation. In practice, there are uh, stepwise important sampling. Um, of course, we, these are things that keep things still unbiased. If you don't care about uh, unbiasedness, you can go to weighted important sampling and other formulations. So the reason that I, in practice, we use the stepwise, uh, because unbiasedness is important for us, but a stepwise has much lower variance than the vanilla formulation. So, but in here, because of the clarity, I just use the vanilla formulation of important sampling. So in practice, we are not using it. If, uh, if you see somewhere that people see this is very high variance, that's true. There are ways to reduce the variance. And then still, still, with all these tricks that we have done, 
and all the data that we have from digital marketing uh, uh, platform that we had, still in some scenarios, this bound was loose. And the box was that, that uh, wise man that never talks. We came up with um, solutions using t-test and using uh, bootstrapping. And these solutions, basically, if they give you the 95% guarantee, it's only if their assumption is not violated. They, are, they give you the, because the nice thing about the concentration inequality, as Tor mentioned, these are very general. When they tell you 95%, it's a 95% guarantee. But uh, here, we see the t-test or bootstrapping, they give you 95% guarantees if their assumption is not violated. But in practice, we basically had to use them because they're much more sample efficient than uh, the concentration inequality. And this is a very uh, nice example that we, we saw. So here, there is a 5% margin for you to make a mistake, but our box, based on the concentration inequalities, refused to use this 5% margin. So it always gave zero error. But what was the outcome? The outcome was if the number of samples was small, he was basically saying, I don't know, I don't know. Right? But when we used bootstrapping or t-test, these algorithms, they started using that 5% margin of error that they could have. Of course, in some cases, you see that the error went above 5% for bootstrapping. So it was a trade-off that we violate our 5% thing a little bit, but we become more sample efficient. Eventually, in some applications, we've had to switch from all these nice concentration inequalities with really 5% guarantees to techniques using bootstrapping. And um, I, we never use t-test in, in, in product, but we use bootstrapping. Okay. So I, um, I don't have much. I, okay, I have time, time until 1.10. Okay, so I have another 25 minutes. Sorry. So let's move to the model-based case. So, so this scenario, we don't build any simulator, uh, but you saw that this is very data-hungry uh, method because we need a lot of data. But we don't use any prior knowledge about the dynamical system because human interaction with human probably coming up with some prior knowledge to build the simulator is not that easy. But uh, anyway, we, we didn't build them any model, but we had a lot of data. So let's, in the model-based case, uh, we more look at the scenarios that it makes sense for us to build a simulator because we have a lot of knowledge about the physics of the domain and so on and so forth, but maybe we don't have as many data as we have in the recommendation case. So that was the scenario. Remember, we build a simulator, we calculate an error bound, and we, using these together, we want to come up with a policy that performs at least as well as the basic. So let's see how this works. Here is very much related to the robust control. So you see a lot of this notation and this uh, machinery that you see here in the robust formulation. There is a true dynamic of the world, which we rep represented with pi, with p star. This is the real dynamic we don't know. The simulator that we built from data, we call it p hat. The error function, so somebody asked what is this error. So this error, there are different ways of representing it. The way that we represented it, we def define it as an L1 between the simulator error one error between the simulator and the true world. So for any state action pair X and A, we have a error, which is the upper bound of the L1 difference between the simulator and the P star. If this bound is loose, of course, whatever I'm telling you from now on is going to be loose the same way, right? So we should assume that this has at least, you know, some tightness in it. So now, think about this. What is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is, my simulator is p hat. I don't know where p star is, but I know that p star is in an L1 ball around this p hat. So this is the, called the feasibility set. So feasibility set is a set around your simulator that contains your true world although you don't know which one, which point in this ball is your true world, but this is the set that contains your true dynamics. Okay? So now, pi star, which is the optimal policy, of course, is the policy that works the best in the true world, and the value of, and now, a policy pi is safe if this policy in the true world performs better than the baseline policy. Okay? 
is the scenario clear? We have this baseline policy that we want to beat. We want to learn this pie such that if I deploy this policy in the real world, that I don't know what is this real world, I only know the vicinity of this real world, it performs better than the baseline. Is everything clear here? Because this is the, again, the notation is very important to, to understand. So that error in the model creates that feasibility set. Okay. So now, let's see how we can, what are the different approaches to tackle this problem. So one way is you say, okay, the dam with robustness, I just learn my simulator and optimize my policy with respect to the simulator. So I presume my p hat is correct. I calculate this policy. Of course, this is a very simple solution, but there is no guarantee that this is safe. Because this is not the true world. What is the second approach? The second approach is the traditional robust approach. The robust approach is this max mean formulation that says, let's maximize for the policy for the worst possible world that can happen in the feasibility set. So it's kind of like an adversarial thinking that you say that, okay, there is a ball that the real world is there. I don't know which element of this ball is the real world, but I assume that God is against me, and whatever policy I take, he picks, picks the worst possible word in that set and put it in front of me. This is, this is what it says. Okay? But now, when you calculate this policy, you do a min-max comparison, saying that, okay, now I have this policy. If this, the worst case performance of this policy is better than the best case performance of the baseline, then this policy is safe and I deploy it. Otherwise, I deploy the baseline. Because remember, if you want to be safe, you can always just act according to the baseline and nobody is going to punish you because you're safe. The question is you want to do better. But you can see that this, although this is a safe, this, this policy is guaranteed to be safe, but this is a very pessimistic approach because you compare your worst case performance against the best case performance of your opponent. So it's a, and uh, although it's safe, it's a very pessimistic solution, right? And it's, there is a very good chance that most of the time you actually decide to act according to pi d instead of ac acting according to this policy. So this is what we propose as the robust policy improvement or the optimization problem that should be solved. And this optimization problem is the maximizing the policy, again, given the worst case word of the difference between the value function of our policy and the value function of the baseline. And we should prove that the, this result is safe, is guaranteed to be safe. And also we prove that this policy can outperform this robust policy that we calculated here. And by, by, out, by, by large margin. And what I, what I mean by outperform means that every time that our policy switches to the baseline, also, the pi r switches to the baseline, but there are many scenarios that pi r switches to the baseline, but v have something to say. Or in, a say, in the other way, we are, we are trading, because here is a trade-off between safety and optimality. We are doing better in terms of the optimality with respect to the pi r. So, just as a side note, for those of you who are familiar with inverse reinforcement learning, that you learn the reward function, the, op the optimization problem that you solve is exactly the same optimization problem by the two changes. One is this feasibility set is not over the transition probability, it's over the reward function, which is much easier to deal with compared to the uncertainty set around the transition probability. And second, this pi b is not the baseline, it's the expert guy that uh, Hal mentioned in imitation formulation. He didn't talk about inverse reinforcement learning, but uh, it's the same expert notion. Okay? Okay, so this is just to prove that our policy is, uh, this is better than the robust solution. So now, let's, so the thing is not done yet. We proposed this optimization problem. The next step we proved that the solution of this optimization problem is 
should be searched in the space of stochastic policies. Meaning that the optimal policy is not necessarily a deterministic policy. Unlike the standard MDP formulation, that we know there is always an optimal policy that is deterministic. Here is not the case. You have to search in the space of stochastic policies. This is a performance bound on the, per, um, uh, on, on, uh, the, po the policy learned that I'm not going to talk about. But then we also proved a very bad negative result, that this optimization problem is empty hard to solve. And as up to now, I still don't have an exact solution for this optimization problem, even if we know it's empty hard. But even a hard algorithm, I don't have something that solves it exactly. There are tricks that by sampling from, uh, from this um, uh, feasibility set and turn the problem to a mixed integer program, we can have an approximate solution, and even reasonable approximate solutions. But I don't have an exact solution for this optimization problem. But now, this was the bad news. The good news was, under a, an assumption that I tell you this assumption is reasonable, this empty hard problem turns to a polynomial problem. And what is the assumption? The assumption is, so mathematically, is the Markov chain induced by pi b is known. But let me explain what it means. Pi b is deterministic in my case. I don't know how to talk about this assumption when the pi b is stochastic. Pi b, the baseline, is deterministic. So now, imagine at each state, the action suggested by pi b, if for that specific action, I know the exact probability of the transition. Then the Markov chain induced by pi b is known, and this problem becomes polynomial. Because this problem is reduced just to a standard robust formulation. Let me repeat again. Imagine that this p hat for any act at any state for the action suggested by the baseline is exact. For the other action, I don't care. But for this action, is correct. Then we have a polynomial solution. So this is the assumption mathematically. Why I'm saying this assumption makes sense? Because in many applications, the data with which you learn your simulator has been generated by this guy. And therefore, for the action suggested by this guy, you have a lot of samples. So your model is accurate around the actions that this guy suggests. Of course, my reduction from MP hard to polynomial is only correct if this error is in fact zero. But of course, in the real world, even for these actions, if you have a lot of data, this error might be very small, but it's not zero. So in the last part of this paper, we basically said if this er we assume that this error, even if it's a small, we pretend that it's zero and solve the problem as a polynomial. And then we empirically showed that still this is a reasonable solution. Is it clear? So of course, if the data has not been generated by the baseline, this assumption basically has no meaning. Okay. So there are some experimental results. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it that much. One of them is a simulator for uh, interaction of the user with the website. The other one um, is a simulator for um, a battery energy arbitrage problem. So let me actually show you the, the graph. So um, these are the number of samples that we, we have. The X is if you just solve the simulator. If you just solve the simulator, you see that in this part that the number of samples is a small. This is a very simple problem. When the data is a small, we are below zero. So it means that we generate an unsafe policy because it's from the simulator. Simulator has no guarantee. But then if you use the robust formulation, we actually remain zero. Up to this point, then we have something meaningful. Meaning that up to this point, the robust for solution, remember, this is the conservative guy. He always suggests pi b. So the difference with pi b remains zero. And then after this many samples, it starts talking. But our approach, this RBC, from a very small number of samples, has something to say, and it performs better than the baseline. So it basically shows that it's much less conservative than the robust form. Forget about this RWE. It's another uh, proposal that I didn't talk about it in this presentation. 
So this is an energy arbitrage problem that is, uh, we have a battery capacity, uh, have, the state space is basically the charging level of the battery, the capacity of the battery, and this capacity, the physics is in a way that the more we charge, this capacity goes down, and then there is a price that we want to see whether we buy the energy or not. We assume that these two parts, the transition of these two parts is known. The only randomness is our uncertainty about the price, the, the basic energy market. And then we apply the same thing. Again, this is a simulator. It's a very simple, we reduce the problem big time. Don't think that we solve the world energy problem. We have, <laughs> but this is a very simple simulator. And uh, here, we, we use our trick. We solve the polynomial problem. And you see that here, for very small number of samples, we violate the constraint. And this is coming from the fact that we ignore that epsilon error and assume that epsilon error is zero and solve the polynomial problem. Okay, so just to summarize, for this problem, the error is defined as an L1 ball around the simulator. This is the uncertainty set. Basically, it's the set that contains your true world. Of course, you don't know what it is. This is the optimization problem that we proposed. We showed that the solution of this optimization problem is safe. We showed that the solution, we proved that the solution of this optimization problem is less conservative than the other solution. We showed that the solution should be searched in the space of stochastic policies, not in the deterministic policies. We showed that the optimization problem is empty hard, and under, under certain assumption, it becomes polynomial. Okay. So now, yes. We look at different, uh, and this is still an open question. We look at other uh, scenarios. We still haven't found anything that improves our algorithm and our scenario. That, you're absolutely right. There are different ways of building this uh, uncertainty set. We look at a bunch. We haven't ma made any progress with, with that, but it's an open question. Okay. Of course, extending this to this here, everything, uh, building this uncertainty set and stuff, we assume that things are finite. If you go to the function approximation infinite spaces, there are other sources of error that uh, creates obstacle for for these methods. It's a very hard problem in general. So I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about it, but uh, here we assume that things are finite and we can build these uncertainty sets. And I didn't tell you actually how difficult or data consuming might be building these uncertainty sets. This is a totally separate problem. I assume that is, is given. Right? So there are a lot of still open questions here that uh, can be addressed. Okay, so let's go to the online case. I have... Um, uh, about five, six minutes, I just um, give you the basic idea. For the online approach, you remember, we are trying to control our exploration, right? We want to make our exploration conservative such that the, the, the manager doesn't uh, get scared, right? So this is a work that we had at uh, NIPS uh, for uh, contextual linear bandits. I was hoping that Tor talks about contextual bandit, but he jumped from bandit to uh, RL and disappointed me, but this is the contextual bandit. Uh, and this is a specifically a contextual linear bandit. So the, for the contextual linear bandit, you can assume that uh, the combination of a state and action is represented by this um, feature phi. There is a theta uh, star, um, and the reward function is the inner product of this feature and this theta star plus some noise. Of course, this theta star, if it's known, then uh, <laughs> the problem is solved. This theta star is not known. Okay. And the expectation, and this uh, noise is in a way that the expectation of this y is the reward function of your action. So this noise is mean zero. Okay. So um, now, um, these are some assumptions, since I'm not going to go to the details. Um, if you're interested, look at the paper or look at the slides. So I'm not going to talk about the assumptions. But these are standard assumptions for uh, contextual linear bandits. Uh, so let's see. Uh, there is an optimal action at each time. And this is the action that has uh, the maximum inner product with this unknown uh, theta star. Of course, we don't know it. But uh, when we talk about regret, you remember um, Tor talked about the notion of regret. So the notion of regret is the difference between how you act and uh, somebody who's good acts. So if we act according to this A star, this is the performance that uh, we have. And this is uh, the performance of acting according to your strategy and AT, and the difference is the regret, and we want to control this regret. This is basically the whole, we want to minimize this regret. 
And this is the whole goal of uh, regret minimization in the contextual linear bandits. So now, what is the conservative contextual linear bandit, which is the scenario that we are interested in? In contextual linear bandit, uh, we have with conservative contextual linear bandit, we have a baseline policy pi e that at each round t selects an action, and this is the manager's strategy. And this action has an expected reward that is uh, coming from this inner product. So in the paper, we look at the scenario that this reward function is known and unknown. In both cases, we observed it. For now, just to, for simplicity, assume that we know this performance. So now, what is the performance constraint? Remember, I told you in the kind of like a very abstract level that this manager at each random time sits down. So at each random time t, he sits down. And what does he do? He does his accounting. And he says, what was the performance if I acted according to my strategy, this sum? What is the performance of this guy that I gave some uh, a part of my traffic, which is this? And if this difference, which is the loss of the manager, is above the alpha percentage of his performance, then he panics. And he kicks you out. So we should make sure that this loss remains below a percentage of the manager's performance. And this alpha is the amount of risk that the manager is willing to take. If this alpha is zero, basically this manager doesn't willing, is not willing to take any risk. So whatever you do, you're not going to make him happy. And if this alpha is one, it's kind of, uh, uh, you can do whatever you want. Okay? So now, the conservative contextual linear bandit is exactly what the linear, what contextual linear bandit is doing, meaning minimizing this regret, but subject to this constraint. So it's a constraint regret minimization. Okay? So is this constraint make sense to you? And this is very important that at any random time you need to guarantee. It's not the case that you know that this manager sits down only on Thursdays and look at the things. He can decide every time to sit down and calculate this loss, and if this loss is bigger than alpha percentage of his performance, you're out. Okay, so um, here basically the goal was to show whether there is a hope to learn in this scenario. And uh, we proposed algorithm. I'm not going to go through the thing. I just go to the regret. So what we have done here, we proposed an algorithm for um, a bandit algorithm for both scenarios that the reward of the expert is, sorry, the baseline, the reward of the baseline is known and unknown. And then we analyzed the algorithm and calculated this risk, is, is regret. And you can see that the regret of this conservative algorithm is the regret of the standard algorithm. And the standard algorithm is basically just do regret minimization with, with not paying attention to the constraint plus some term. And this term has, has nice properties. It's very interpretable in the sense that if this alpha is zero, this term blows up. This is the scenario that the manager has, uh, is, is nasty, and uh, depends on things that it should depend on. So basically, it means that you're going to lose just an additive term, and the rate of growth of this term is smaller than this uh, log t root square t. And this is good. In both cases, we showed this. And these are some experiments um, that we have here. Um, I, so this is the summary. Basically, uh, we do the regret minimization with a constraint. And in both cases of knowing this reward function and not knowing this reward function, we propose algorithm and prove regret and show that if manager is reasonable, which this alpha is not zero, this problem is uh, is not hopeless to, to look at. But of course, the amount that you lose in terms of the regret compared to the case that you don't give a damn about the, the constraint depends on many factors that you can imagine. Right? If this alpha is small, then you have to sacrifice a lot because you have to play very conservatively to make this guy happy. So of course, you lose in terms of optimality. Right? Okay. So I'm stopping, I, I stop here. There are a few slides just for you to get a sense of what we mean by risk-sensitive decision-making. There's nothing deep here. It's just some 
uh, slides to give you uh, an idea of what we mean by risk sensitive decision making. And then uh, we have also this uh, safety with respect to undesirable situation. I had a video to show you uh, just to uh, entertain you, but it's, uh, it's enough. I'm, uh, I'm over time. And uh, these two are optional there. Uh, just a few slides. It's nothing deep there. And if you are interested, uh, for the risk, actually, a long list of publication uh, that uh, both I have done with my former postdocs and interns and the group of Shai Menor at Technion done, have done, and we did also together. So it's a long uh, list of the work that we have done there. Uh, for the safety with respect to the situation, uh, there are other work outside, and I have some recent work that uh, we recently uh, published, but these are optional. And for another time, another summer school. Thank you very much.